This is the podcast, A Different Lens, produced by the Hampton Institute. Today we have online Andrew Gavin Marshall, uh, Geopolitics Department Chair at the Hampton Institute, uh, where we will be discussing his most recent series, uh, Empire Under Obama. How are you doing, Andrew? I'm pretty good, thanks. How about yourself? Uh, doing good. Doing good. Um, so overall, I definitely enjoyed reading your series. I definitely learned a lot. Um, but I did want to bring up some questions I have for you. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned at the very uh, first part of the series that um, Noam Chomsky and how he discusses um, how uh, international relations is like the mafia in many cases, and you extend that notion to the U.S. and its allies, with the U.S. essentially being the godfather and its um, main um, allies, you know, in NATO, you know, Britain, uh, France, Germany, like being high-level bosses. So I want to ask, um, do you uh, think that the U.S. Is, lo- is losing its influence with its high-level bosses due to recent NSA spying revelations, such as uh, such as with the case of Germany's Angela Merkel? Um, I think that the U.S. is more losing its influence with the rest of planet Earth. Uh, in regards to its sort of high-level capos, as to use mafia terminology, um, you know, allies like Germany and such with the uh, NSA revelations. I mean, there's no way in hell that Germany didn't know that uh, their citizens were being spied upon. And the only real um, uh, supposed conflict is the fact that Angela Merkel herself uh, was having her phone calls um, monitored. But if she's the chancellor of Germany and she doesn't expect to be uh, spied on by the United States, then she's not a very intelligent chancellor. I mean, if you are a capo, you better believe that the godfather is going to be keeping tabs. Um, other than that, it seems more like a, a domestic political wrangling on her part, and I wouldn't expect it to lead to much. Where it's more interesting, however, is uh, the effect that the revelations are having uh, on the rest of the world. So take Brazil and Argentina, um, where there's now discussion about um, Latin American countries working with Asian countries and other countries around the world to set up um, a a, a new um, uh, lines of information and internet access that would go around the NSA and essentially avoid the NSA and where such inter- internet connections would not be moving through the United States itself, uh, or at least not under the control of American companies, which happily hand over all the information to the National Snoop Agency. So I think that you see a, a few more interesting things happening um, with the non-capo governments, because uh, the capos are capos for a reason. They know where their loyalty stands. Sure, they can, um, certainly I think there's a valid argument that uh, the U.S. is losing its uh, once unquestioned influence with um, the other larger, more powerful states of the world. But where the influence is really on the decline is um, across the rest of Earth. And in Latin America, it's no surprise that you see some of the greatest resistance uh, and reactions to the NSA spying scandal from Latin America, because this is a region that um, has essentially been uh, removing itself from uh, Western hegemony. Uh, not entirely and in different ways and to varying degrees of success and or failure, but the changes have been obvious over the past uh, decade and a half or so, um, wh- where you've had all the, all the military ba- U.S. military bases have been kicked out of the region, except for in Colombia, which remains the major pliant um, U.S. ally in the region and also the main violator of human rights and not coincidentally the main recipient of U.S. military aid and also a large narco state. Um, This 
this is a still a profound change that all these other countries have kicked out U.S. military bases. And if you look, there was a map recently published by the Washington Post a few months back, um, which took a look at all the countries in the world that helped the United States with its global torture rendition CIA kidnapping program. And there was, you know, dozens and dozens, over 100 countries, I believe, that helped the United States in this program. Uh, if you look at the map, it highlights all the countries in the world. You know, basically all the Western states are highlighted. Um, so virtually all of Europe and North America and a lot of the other industrial powers and then almost all the Middle Eastern and Arab countries because they're run by, you know, nice U.S.-supported dictators and then a ton of sub-Saharan African countries and Asian countries. One place on the map remained completely blank, and that was Latin America. Uh, so that's another sign of this um, declining influence of the United States. And in the region where the U.S. had since 1823 with the declaration of the Monroe Doctrine, uh, considered the whole region of Latin America to be its quote-unquote backyard um, and strictly under uh, U.S domination, much like how Sub-Saharan Africa was considered to be sort of the European playground. Uh, that was uh, Latin America for the United States, and that's been changing. And um, you see this changing all over the world with different uh, countries in different contexts. I mean, the Arab Spring is another example of declining U.S. influence. But uh, literally name the conflict and name the region, and you see U.S. influence on the decline. Um, so naturally, it will tend to decline with a lot of the uh, capo allies, but by no means compared to the, the level of decline with the rest of planet Earth. All right. Uh, definitely some interesting information. I didn't know about that Washington Post map, and I just know that over 100 countries when help the U.S., that's definitely surprising. Mm -hmm. Especially, well, even more so, you can say that there are only about... 200 ish or so countries in the world, period. So that's definitely surprising. Yeah. Um, in the article, the same article um, mentioned um, a report from the Bush 1991 administration where they go and they um, discuss um, not wanting to get involved in um, protracted or indecisive conflicts because. They have the potential to embarrass the U.S. and um, undercut political support for U.S. efforts. Uh, and I um, want to ask you, how does that relate to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan where such protect, protracted and decisive and indecisive conflicts have occurred? Because, uh, you know, we have this uh, report in 1991 saying, hey, we shouldn't get involved in such conflicts, but then, um, you, know, uh, you know, 10 or so years later, we do get involved. Yeah, the, um, that was an internal national security study memorandum written by uh, Brent Scowcroft, who was Bush uh, Sr.'s national security advisor. Um, Scowcroft is uh, of the same ilk as uh, Henry Kissinger and Zbigniew Brzezinski, and in fact, they all serve on various boards together, such as at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, etc. Um, the report noted that um, the U.S. should undertake to win uh, rapid and decisive victories against weaker enemies. And sort of the weaker the state is, the more rapid, the more decisive, the more brutal the American victory would have to be. Um, because, of course, this sends a message. You know, you have to punish um, uh, one to make an example for the many. Uh, so if a small, poor um, state, say, like Iraq, uh, decides to uh, disobey orders from the empire, which Iraq did, when Saddam Hussein sought to industrialize the country and build up um, a domestic economy and society and sort of uh, attempt to really build um, uh, the country for the sake of building the country and for the largely for a good 
percentage of the population of the country. I mean, despite the fact that he was a horrible dictator and uh, killed tons of his own people, he undertook um, efforts to uh, really industrialize the country. And uh, this was not in the Western imperial interests. Um, so they had to punish the country and uh, they bombed it and imposed sanctions and um, committed genocide, truly. Uh, and then you had the following 2003 invasion. And this was a long protracted uh, war without a decisive victory, despite the banner hanging down in the background when uh, Bush the Younger um, got in his uh, military costume and paraded about on the boat with mission accomplished behind him. Um, this, the reasoning, um, I suppose, uh, is uh, really that the report, the 1991 report, was accurate in that it was not in the U.S. interest to get involved in large ground, uh, large-scale ground wars and invasions and protracted conflicts. Um, precisely, if you look at Afghanistan and Iraq, this has had a deleterious effect on American hegemony, not only in those respective regions, but around the world. In both Iraq and Afghanistan today, following massive uh, wars and occupations, and with the continuing occupation of Afghanistan, you see American influence visibly declining in both of these countries. I mean, usually you think that after a you know, decade-long war and occupation and setting up puppet governments and having troops in the country and, you know, killing millions or hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands or however many thousands, um, you'd think that that would mean that you would have some sort of staying power uh, and constant influence. But it's actually turned to the opposite. Everything uh, that the U.S. tries to impose, that NATO tries to impose, you find great resistance to. There was, in fact, back in 2008, a uh, U.S. National Intelligence Council uh, trend report. So the National Intelligence Council is sort of the grouping of all 16 U.S. intelligence agencies. Yes, there are 16 of them. Don't ask me to name them. I can't. But uh, they produced this trend report looking at general global trends, uh, working in tandem with a large uh, American and Anglo-American think tanks. Um, to sort of assess the general trends they see in the world without comment of how they're actually moving and working to uh, direct these trends. But again, that's just a technicality. Um, and when it came to Afghanistan, they explained that uh, no matter what we do, whatever uh, structures and institutions we build will likely be torn down when we leave because they're viewed as the vestiges of modern imperialism. So they generate great resistance. So whatever causes and issues that the U.S. promotes in these countries, um, at least publicly, uh, this creates a powerful political backlash because it's seen as a form of um, imperial patronage that the governing institutions and ideologies, be it Western state capitalist uh, democracy, um, be it the parliaments or presidency or internal intelligence agency, secret police, uh, domestic military forces, um, which is really what the U.S. strategy is now in both Iraq and Afghanistan, is simply to uh, facilitate the development of strong domestic police and military forces to control those, you know, uh, um, restless populations in those countries. But the truth is that uh, both of those long protracted wars uh, have rapidly accelerated um, American imperial domination of the world and more specifically uh, have done enormous damage to America's reputation around the world, both with its allies and with its pliant client states who look at that situation and see that the once unquestioned godfather of international relations uh, can barely even uh, manage to, or can barely manage the transitions um, and the internal politics of countries that it's occupied for over a decade. Um, that's a pretty profound 
uh, symbol to the rest of the world and one that the rest of the world has very much noticed and uh, this is quite clear so when it came to that 1991 internal national security council document uh, they were quite accurate in saying that it would be a problem for the united states to get involved in these large-scale wars but the reason why they happened is because you got a small clique of um sort of lunatics uh, lunatic psychopaths called neoconservatives who entered the administration and thought that they were back in 19th century uh, European colonial era uh, where they could do whatever the hell they wanted and not face any actual repercussions uh, geopolitically speaking. You had uh, top uh, geopolitical strategists, which is sort of a euphemism for imperial strategists like Brzezinski, who during the Bush era of the so-called war on terror, um, who was speaking out exactly against these things for these exact reasons, not because he has any principles that war and empire is wrong. He doesn't. He believes the opposite. But it's really that uh, long, uh, large-scale ground wars and occupations are damaging to our interests in the long run, that we can't maintain colonial wars in post in the supposed post-colonial period, uh, that our influence is waning, that our reputation is deteriorating, uh, and that we have to be um, conscious of the real changes in the world, of the real realities of changing power structures and dynamics, and especially in relation to uh, increasingly restless and politically activated global populations, that these wars are no longer um, possible uh, in terms of pursuing them and simultaneously pursuing American imperial interests. They now run counter to that. Uh, that document in 1991 understood that. Brzezinski uh, understood that during the Bush years and presumably still does. Um, it's uh, that doesn't mean that uh, <laughs> these wars didn't happen because you have uh, differences within uh, policy circles and elite circles. Uh, but, um, I mean, that's just the reality. Definitely. Uh, to me, that there, is the way you were talking about it, there was definitely kind of a conflict between the... Uh, in, in terms of thinking between the neocons and just your, um, you know, kind of um, usual suspects, for lack of a better term in terms, imperialist, and they uh, were kind of butting heads. So that's definitely interesting to see the conflicts between them. Um, but later in the article, you talk about the U.S., um, combating Egyptian nationalism in the 1950s, and you bring up uh, Saudi Arabia and Jordan. I want to ask, is a similar situation happening in regard to Syria? Because um, both countries I just mentioned um, are actively supporting the Syrian anti-government uh, insurgency. I know it's not exactly within the same kind of political context per se, but I just found it uh, interesting because, you know, Syria is being overrun by foreign backed insurgency and Assad, um, while a horrible dictator 100% kind of is an embodiment of um, Syrian nationalism in the sense of wanting a sovereign, independent Syria. So I want to get uh, your take on that. Yeah, Syria is um, a rather complex uh, case, but there are certain parallels to the period, uh, the post World War II period of um, heightened Arab nationalism uh, in the uh, Middle East and North Africa. Um, at the time, it was largely Egypt under Nasser that was seen as really the image and leadership for Arab, Arab nationalism. And as internal US documents from uh, the State Department, National Security Council, uh, various intelligence agencies and military officials, uh, they revealed 
these have all since been declassified, but essentially that they saw Arab nationalism as the primary threat to U.S. domination of the region, uh, which was a given. The U.S. had to dominate the region, obviously. Um, and they saw Nasser and uh, Arab nationalism itself as the main threats. Um, and they assessed these threats and they discussed them and why is the U.S. so hated. There was a whole study undertaken on uh, the fact that the U.S. was hated in the region because it was perceived as promoting the status quo, which means supporting ruthless tyrants and dictators such as those in Jordan and Saudi Arabia and Iraq and elsewhere. And, uh, and that it was seen as, uh, the U.S. was seen as attempting to forestall um, the changes of uh, populist um, passions, that what the people wanted, the U.S. was against. That the U.S. wanted to dominate the oil and energy of the region, to weaken the Arabs, um, to control the region. And even these internal assessments acknowledge that this was essentially true, um, but that ultimately the U.S. would have to attempt to publicly endorse Arab nationalism for fear of losing um, any semblance of uh, legitimacy to the people in the region, but to privately attempt to steer it um, in a way that was safe for American interests. So they attempted to um, push Saudi Arabia uh, and several other countries to the front of the line in terms of promoting Arab nationalism, which was, of course, a an absurd failure. But um, the fact is that uh, the attempt was really to um, move in and steer the changes as best they could. And this is really the context that you get to today in terms of the Arab Spring, where these changes were um, a long time coming and uh, where once they started and began and uh, really erupted uh, in Tunisia and Egypt, um, and then all across the region, including in Syria, uh, you had sort of panic among policymakers. So when you read about the Obama administration's policy throughout the Arab Spring, most often what you'll hear is that there's not a one-size-fits-all policy, that it's determined on a country-by-country -country basis. This is essentially a means of saying we're going to be as hypocritical as humanly possible. So what the policy translates into is that suddenly the U.S. decides, uh, after supporting a ruthless military dictatorship for, under Mubarak for 30 years in Egypt, now they're going to pretend that they like democracy and that they're going to support a transition to democracy, which means that they're going to attempt to organize an opposition party um, to move into power and attempt to... Uh, keep them very allied and close to the U.S., and uh, to manage a uh, state capitalist democratic system modeled on that of the U.S., where the population's participation in a democracy comes down to voting for which faction of the elites you want to rule over you and in the interest of the American empire. Uh, so that was their vision for change in those countries, which, as we can see, did not work out very well. And then you have uh, the other countries like Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, where uh, they just support ruthless outright uh, repression. Um, so right after Mubarak was ousted, um, Admiral Mike Mullen, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs at the time, uh, was quickly sent to... Uh, Saudi Arabia to Jordan to the Gulf dictatorships to meet with all the local uh, dictators and tyrants to reassure them that the U.S. Uh, was not going to throw them overboard. Because when they so saw Mubarak was tossed aside, um, they were all flipping out uh, because they thought if Mubarak can go, they can go. And that's accurate um, in a general sense. So they um, organized... Uh, really around Saudi Arabia to become counter-revolutionary forces in the region. So the recent uh, coup in Egypt was funded, um, financed ultimately by the Saudis, by Kuwait, and um, some of the other Gulf dictatorships.
so the U.S. has lost a great deal of leverage in Egypt, whereas when the coup took place and the U.S. was attempting to use its leverage, including threatening to cut off the $1.3 billion in annual military aid, uh, the Saudis and Gulf dictatorships uh, guaranteed $12 billion in aid to the new uh, military dictatorship. That makes the U.S. $1.3 billion um, virtually obsolete. Uh, so the U.S. is losing its influence, and all the other dictators in the region and local tyrants organize really major regional counter-revolutionary forces. And there's also competition between them for increasing influence in the region, such as between Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Um, Qatar was supporting the Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt. Um, both Saudi Arabia and Qatar have been supporting various rebel groups inside Syria. Uh, but often they're very different rebel groups and opposed to one another. Um, so they're throwing a lot of money at their problems because they have a lot of money to throw. And the U.S. is trying to uh, maintain its influence with them, trying to continue um, its cooperation with them, and at the same time attempt to steer its own general strategies. So when it comes to Syria, uh, the... Uh, Arab states were basically um, ahead of the U.S. in uh, pushing for um, uh, violence and war. Uh, Israel was, of course, also there uh, pushing for the same strategy. But the real strategy inside Syria uh, was probably best articulated by a, a former um, Israeli high-level military official who was quoted in the New York Times back in September, um, who said that essentially uh, the conflict in Syria is good for Israel because it just has, um, it's basically a large bloodletting where they just kill each other and uh, that ultimately benefits um, Israel and the United States and the Arab countries. So the real strategy in Syria is not to have a victory by the rebels and not to remove Assad, um, but to keep the conflict continuous, to keep the blood flowing. Because the real um, target uh, in uh, regional politics, the target for the Saudis, the target for most of the dictatorships and the target for the United States and Israel um, has been for years Iran. So Iran is, of course, closely allied to Syria. Um, Syria also has ties to Hezbollah and Hamas, which are considered the other uh, major problems for Western um, imperial powers in the region. And as the conflict in Syria grows, it draws in Syria's allies. So while Iran and Hezbollah expend the resources, throwing you know, money, weapons, uh, materials into the Syrian civil war, uh, that becomes a drain on their resources and uh, potentially their influence begins to wane across the region because Saudi Arabia views Iran as its main regional foe in terms of um, gaining uh, a sort of regional hegemony by the local um, uh, powers, what U.S. Uh, uh, imperial planners used to refer to as the cops on the beat. Um, so it's a competition, a regional proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia. It's a global proxy war between the United States and Iran and Russia. Um, it's an internal uh, conflict between um, various different populations within Syria against their government, against the rebels. Um, you have, uh, it's very complicated. The rebels are not a united faction uh, by any means. I saw one uh, quote from a defense intelligence uh, agency official who suggested that there were over a thousand different rebel groups uh, inside Syria at any given time. And uh, the internal dynamics uh, of this cannot be uh, put into black and white um, 
uh, put into a black and white understanding of uh, you have, there's not two sides, in other words. Uh, it's not government versus rebels. You have government versus certain pockets of resistance. You have rebels against each other, rebels against the government. You have also continuation. It's not really talked about, of course, but continuation of peaceful protests, student activists, um, all sorts of other um, uh, complexities in this conflict, and massive human suffering. Um, hundreds, over 100,000 killed uh, and increasing. And so if you look at the reasons why the U.S. wanted to suddenly bomb Syria, it wasn't because uh, they wanted the rebels to win. If you look at the statements, they say, uh, you know, John Kerry and Obama and others have said specifically that the aim of military strikes would not have been to remove Assad. Because if they remove Assad, then suddenly you need a new government. And considering the most powerful um, opposition forces happen to be the most radical uh, jihadi militant groups funded by Saudi Arabia, um, this would be problematic. Ultimately, Israel certainly wouldn't like that. The U.S. wouldn't know how to deal with it, and they would have almost no influence. Um, the Saudis claim that they have influence over all these groups, but who knows how far that grow that goes. Um, it's it would become you know essentially uh, Libya 2.0, where you have a failed state, but um, with uh, far greater uh, consequences. And the Arab states don't necessarily want it to collapse because they didn't really care about Libya or if that government collapsed. Because the truth is, none of them really sit next to it. Um, so the Gulf dictatorships didn't really care about Libya. Sure, get rid of the guy who's been a thorn in their side for decades. But uh, what comes after, they don't really care if it's a failed state spreading devastation through the region because they're not its direct neighbors. Uh, when it comes to Syria, Syria is in this position where it's neighbor to many powerful states, um, to Turkey and Jordan and Israel and Iraq and very close to uh, the Gulf dictatorships. Um, you know, Henry Kissinger once said that in Middle Eastern politics, if you want to make war, you need Egypt. If you want to make peace, you need Syria. Well, look what's happening to Syria, and that says pretty much all we need to know about peace in the region and where the priorities of Western states are in terms of uh, pushing for peace. They're pushing for protracted civil war where they don't put boots on the ground. Um, their aim is to tilt the balance. That was all the comments they made when they were advocating for military strikes in Syria. They simply wanted to tilt the balance on the battlefield. So what happened was that you had Hezbollah come into Syria and help the government um, in uh, combating various rebel groups, and they were making decisive victories. The rebels were declining rapidly, and that is the moment at which the United States decided uh, regardless of the chemical weapons use or who used them or whatnot, uh, that's when the United States decided that it wanted to undertake military strikes to tilt the balance battlefield, not to have a rebel victory, but also to prevent a government victory. The conflict must be continuous, the blood must continue to flow, because then that uh, becomes a suction cup, a sort of uh, black hole of resources for regional um, enemies. And that's really the objective in Syria. The fact that it's not really articulated as a strategy because it's so monstrous. Um, so you can't really, you know, you can't imagine Obama going up on television and saying, I would like the civil war in Syria to continue for as long as possible. But military generals will say that we have to acknowledge that this will be going on for a decade, etc. They make other comments like this. So they see it in those terms. And it's well, the Israelis will articulate the actual strategy, but that's because they're already the world's number one pariah state. They don't really care what people think about them um, because people, Earth already uh, doesn't think about them very uh, highly. So, I mean, that's, that's the strategy. Very interesting there. You pick up some stuff that uh, my own, own analysis I hadn't um, really thought about. Um, Next question is, um, does the change in political language reflect the manner in which U.S. policies um, are pursued? Um, for example, you uh, now, you know, you don't really hear about Obama going and detaining people. Uh, he just goes and kills them because that's a lot easier. 
and then we have Terror Tuesdays and whatnot. I wanted to ask uh, that. Sorry, what's the question? Does the change in political language reflect a change in the manner in which U.S. policies are pursued? Uh, basically, does, um, for example, you mentioned that we went from war on terror to uh, Obama's insanely vague and obscure overseas contingency operations. And like, do changes of that sort reflect um, a change in what U.S. policies are pursued? Um, not necessarily. I mean, it's a change in rhetoric rather than a change in substance. And that's really the function of political language, which Orwell explained was designed to make lies sound truthful, murder respectable, and to give a feeling of solidity to pure wind. Um, that's really the function and object of political language. Um, when uh, it comes to changing, say, the terminology of the war on terror, from using the term war on terror to the term overseas contingency operations, which apart from the original articles and statements declaring that this was a change in rhetoric, you really haven't heard that terminology since then, which was back in early 2009. Uh, so, but you also really don't hear very often the claim of war on terror uh, from policymakers anyway. You'll still hear media and certain other uh, commentators um, use the term war on terror simply because you can't really expect them to use the term overseas contingency operations. I think there's too many syllables for, um, uh, you know, empty headed pundits to, um, regurgitate too often. But, um, the policies, there, there have been changes in the policies, but these are not humane changes. Um, these are not, uh, changes that you can, uh, necessarily articulate without sound or justify without sounding monstrous. Uh, that's why you have to use euphemism and um, vagueness and uh, uh, meaningless words to describe uh, your policies and programs. So the policies can change, like you explained. It's gone from a Bush torture program to a global assassination. Um, that's a little different. It's one that's speculated in those words. Uh, instead, justified as uh, allowing the U.S. to draw down its large, uh, large-scale ground wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And of course, it's to protect U.S. troops, right? You don't have to send in um, young Americans to go kill uh, poor people around the world. You can just bomb them from the flying killer robots in the sky. So it's, it's very humane. Um, and so you have to use language which uh, obscures reality. So it's about uh, targeted killings of terror suspects and um, where they kill militants, of course. Uh, so every time you hear of a drone bombing and there's such and such number of militants killed, um, well, I mean, how do, you, how, do you, how do they know how many militants were killed? Do they have membership on them, name tags? This goes back to the Vietnam War, where whoever the Americans killed, they just called Vietnam. Um, or in Afghanistan, where you just call them Taliban or Al-Qaeda, and then you're fine. Uh, when it comes to the drone bombings, you call them militants. And this is a specific CIA policy, that if they happen to kill any men between the ages of 16 and I believe it's 48, um, these are, those are considered military-age males. Therefore, if they die when we bomb them, we will call them militants. So it doesn't matter if there are a bunch of civilians that you happen to bomb uh, and explode in this poor little village in Yemen, for example. If they are male and between the ages of 16 and 48, then they're militants. That's how the counting is done in the U.S. But, and by the CIA, which runs the drone programs for the most part. Um, this has even created opposition from other agencies, including the State Department and even military agencies who say this isn't a very helpful method of counting. Um, but the CIA, you know, they just do what they do. Um, it's, it's, and they continue to do that. But the language is an important factor. And, uh, you know, but you look at some of the language uh, that's used. So, for example, when it comes to the... Um, drone bombings again every Tuesday as you uh, 
uh, reference, the White House has a uh, meeting where they assemble a, what used to be called the kill list. So every Tuesday, Obama meets with his uh, aides and they decide who in the world um, they're going to kill that week. And it was literally called the kill list. Well, that's pretty blunt. Um, that's, that's a little too direct, a little too honest. So that has since changed. And the list is now called a um, um, disposition matrix, um, just in case there was any ambiguity. Um, it's now about uh, purportedly deciding who must be disposed of uh, and give it some, you know, just add in the word matrix for fun, I guess. But uh, it's gone from kill list to disposition matrix. So it's more obscure. Uh, this just happens to be a change that took place as the U.S. was saying they were going to make their drone bombings uh, uh, more um, uh, directed, more uh, managed and with better oversight and, and uh, care for, you know, potential civilian casualties. So again, change the rhetoric, not the substance. Uh, that's the general aim. Policies change because policymakers change, uh, but the rhetoric is continuously deceptive. Um, political language uh, has really been um, in a slow devolution. So over the years, it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. And you can expect it to get increasingly worse and bizarre uh, in coming years. And that's just about a representation of the decline um, of our language and our ability to communicate openly and honestly with one another. Uh, that's the function of political language is to really destroy language and communication and to obfuscate and manipulate. Definitely, I'd have to definitely agree on the use of political language how it's used, as you were saying, to uh, essentially lie to the public. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the interview.